we gather together in the light that was before, is now, and ever will be. We seek the light's ancient wisdom. We gather in the light that is God's continuing gift. We live into the light's new wisdom. We gather in the light that is our own, emerging anew each day. We seek to share this wisdom, nurtured in the light from Bethlehem's cradle. invocation. God of light and love, in this very moment the star still beckons. Gather us and let the star call us to new ways of healing and hope, restoration and renewal, as we discover again Christ's call to discipleship. scripture is from Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you, the wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. The Gospel lesson is from Matthew chapter 2. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. 
When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Wednesday and the power of three. You see, Wednesday was the day before my birthday. And actually, I count the day before my birthday as part of my birthday. And this is because I was born on the little tiny island of Guam in the South Pacific, and it's on the other side of the international dateline. So when I was born at about 3 a.m. on January 7th, Guam time, it was about 9 a.m. January 6th in California, which is where my grandparents were when they got the phone call that they had a brand new baby granddaughter, me. My grandmother never could remember that my birthday was January 7th, so her whole life she thought it was the 6th. I didn't quite understand that when I was a kid, why she couldn't remember. But when I was an adult and I started to understand how the international dateline worked, 
I thought, well, this is great. If one birthday is good, two is even better. So I started telling people that I was going to celebrate my birthday on both days. So this year, like I do every year, I got up in the morning on January 6th and teased my family that I was ready to start my birthday. But when I checked my news, when I checked my phone and saw the news, I saw that a mob of angry people had stormed into the Capitol in Washington, D.C. and were being really disruptive and very violent. You probably know what happened because you were probably in school or at home with your parents and perhaps the adults around you were watching it and getting nervous about it. And I hope that they were explaining to you what was happening and letting you know that you were safe. So eventually on Wednesday, the Capitol Police were able to restore order and the government got back to work with the final step, which is what they were doing in electing our new president. This assault on Washington, D.C., on our nation's capital, was a terrible event because people were hurt. And the only other time in U.S. history that the Capitol had been attacked like that was in 1814 when we were at war with Britain. Yet in the end, a couple of days ago, order was restored, our new president was approved, and our government continued to function. In truth, our democracy, or the power of our government, continued to work in the way that it was supposed to, even though there were some people who tried to attack it. Which brings me to the power of three. The United States government has three branches of power. People who make the laws, Congress. People who carry out the laws, the president and the cabinet and the executive branch and people who study and judge the laws to make sure that they're fair and appropriate, the courts. The people who wrote our Constitution believed that all three of these bases of power were really important because they wanted to make sure that no one could ever try to grab too much power or set themselves up as a king. They believed that these three bases of power would make government more stable. And it mostly works. On Wednesday, the rioters were angry because they believed that the election in November hadn't been fair and that Donald Trump should still be president at the end of the day. They obviously got carried away and didn't understand that our government was working the way it was supposed to. Because after the election, when some people got worried, the lawmakers in the states that were in question got together with the governors to check that no one had cheated. They investigated and found that the elections were fair. Then the courts were asked to look at the work that the lawmakers and the leaders had done, and they also found that the elections were accurate. You see, states also have these three branches of government, and they used all three of them to make sure that everyone's vote was counted fairly and accurately. The way I see it, it all got a little wonky at the national level when the executive branch, the president, didn't work with the other two branches to make sure that the democracy was working. So people got scared, people got mad, people got crazy, and other people got hurt. Okay, so this is a church lesson, not a history class. Where am I going with this? Well, it's about the power of three. You remember, I'm sure, that three is important in our faith as well. We have God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. So God is the power, the executive branch, if you will. And Jesus could be like the lawmaking branch because Jesus taught us how to love God and love each other. Jesus gave us structure and rules and tasks to carry out as Christians. And the Holy Spirit, the number three, ties it all together like the courts do, connecting the power and the practices and making faith part of our own minds, hearts, and souls. Three is a big deal in the Bible. Jesus was tempted by Satan three times. Noah had three sons. David prayed three times a day. The Ark of the Covenant had three sacred items. Baby Jesus was given three gifts by the Magi. And of course, Jesus was resurrected on the third day. And three is important in other areas, too. Stools with three legs are very stable. Information grouped in threes is easier to remember. 
There were three little pigs, three bears, and of course, genies always give us three wishes. As we start the season of Epiphany, the season of Revelation, I have three specific prayers. First, I pray that those people that are feeling lost and angry and scared in our country can grow and find comfort and understanding. Second, I pray that the people who hold power, whoever they are, will use it wisely to keep us balanced and healthy as a nation. And third, I pray for God's grace to guide us through our challenging times. This week, I encourage you to find three things to pray about. Three is such a powerful number that maybe I should find a way to celebrate my birthday for three days next year, though maybe that's pushing it a little bit. I wish you a very stable week. Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this day. Amen. Epiphany is one of my favorite festivals with the darkest blue of the sky, the mysterious and exotic magi from the glamorous east, and the splendor of their rare and costly gifts. It's a story that wants to draw us deeper into a sense of mystery. And in the church, it leads then into the full season of Epiphany, when the wondrous tales of Jesus' revealings to the world are retold. The theme of Epiphany is revelation. God revealed among us. People's fascination down the ages has added new dimension to the story, so that an unspecified number of wise men has become three kings. And the gifts that they brought have been given defined meanings. But today, I encourage you to put aside what the theologians have ascribed as the meaning of these gifts and the additions to the story and focus on where these wise travelers from the East went home by another road. The wise men, or we three kings from Orient are, whose journey was celebrated this past Wednesday, are what I like to call the first Christian civil disobedience. They were told to do one thing by those in political power of the time, and they chose to defy that order because it stood against their righteous beliefs. And they traveled home by another road. Herod was an illegal alien since he was not an Israelite, but an Idumean, one descending from the Edomites that populated Judea many centuries before Jesus' birth. He had many connections with the Roman Empire, though, and received puppet king prestige from the Roman occupiers. When the visit of the three Magi took place. Herod was ready to die. After 40 years of ruling the Israelites on behalf of Rome, he was able to maneuver all that time in power due to police brutality and cruelty. And still, he is frightened with the news of the Magi the intriguing royal child, and the talking stars. Herod considered that news a concern of national security. 
his politics based on secrecy and terror still are mimicked by current Herods who don't listen to Martin Luther King Jr.'s prophetic words. History is the long and tragic story of the fact that the privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. Under the guise of paying homage to the newborn baby, Herod hides his intentions of obliterating the baby from the map and removing him from history. However, he didn't live to carry out that killing. That accomplishment belonged to his son, Herod Antipas, who crucified Jesus some 30 years later. When Herod the Great, very proud of his humility, achieved was to massacre the first martyrs of the Christian church. The star struck him with fear, and when Herod got fearful, people were in grave danger. First, he tried to get the Magi to give him the baby's exact whereabouts. The wise men of our story got their wisdom from dreams, reading the skies, ancient writings, and other scholars. While dreaming, they were able to see the evil that Herod tried to conceal behind a pious mask, and they chose to travel home by another road, thus allowing for Jesus' safety. The Magi didn't pay attention to Herod's insinuation, when you find him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. They knew that in politics, an insinuation is an order. Just as the rioters did on Wednesday from Trump's insinuations. But our heroes opted for another road, a road these obviously wealthy men of wisdom probably had not taken before since in their country they would have been pampered and powerful. Taking the road less traveled wouldn't have been normal, and it wouldn't have been their first choice. Something must have changed in them, in their encounter with that babe born in Bethlehem. For now, they stood against the powers of this world, the power of violence, corruption, and deceit, and they went home by another road. In response to the wise men's secret departure, Herod does a terrible thing. He has all of the male infants in and around Bethlehem killed. And just to be sure he gets the right one, he kills all of them under the age of two even one of his own sons. There was an idiom around Jerusalem in those days which said, in Herod's house, his pigs are safer than his children. So today as we sing, go tell it on the mountain, we hear again about children dying senselessly and mothers weeping uncontrollably. Evil people have been perfecting evil for centuries. Whenever there is an opportunity to stand in the way of peace or work against love or insult human dignity, evil people have found a way to do it. The example of the wise men, those visionaries whose vision was expanded, sought a new way home on another road, presenting a path of a new way of living, a way of living that stands against the oppressive powers that be in the name of love.
let us, like those wise ones, move forward with this same vision. As Howard Thurman wrote, when the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins to find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nation, to bring peace among all, to make love our goal. The wise ones are representatives of traveling by a road not paved with injustice, oppression, and violence, but by another road that leads to wholeness and peace and love. Amen. As we come before God in prayer, we have lived a difficult week. Because of the rioting and insurrection that took place on our U.S. Capitol on Wednesday, the day of Epiphany, when God's light is remembered as breaking into this world, numerous people were injured. Five people have died, and who knows what the cost of the damage will be. Not only damage to things, but damage to our country and to our unity. And so today, I encourage you to hold our country in your prayers to hold the family and friends of those who died or were injured because of the riots. Let us pray. Holy One, in the story of the three wise ones, we are taught that when we come to worship the babe, your son sent to this earth to redeem us, that like those three wise ones, we are also called to travel a different road, another road than the one that has been set before us by the world's status quo. And so we are to sow love where there is hate, courage where there is fear, and justice 
where there is injustice. As a country, we have gone through a very difficult time in these past days. And so today we ask for your comfort, but also for your strength, for us to continue in our commitment to walk another road. O oh God, hear us now as we lift to you our silent joys and concerns. Oh, God, hear our prayers lifted to you in the light that was revealed in Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Now may the peace of Christ that passes all understanding, the love of God which knows no bounds, and the courage and strength of the Holy Spirit which sustains us be with you today and always. Amen. Thank you.